This month on 219 West, juggling kids and career while caring for aging parents. When I had Kate, my dad, um, he was like, I think just about retired. There has been an increasing number of Thai restaurants in New York City. We unravel the mystery of why so much Thai. The hearts of people through their stomach, really. So, and I mean, what better way is there to do that, really? Plus, fighting anti-Semitism with an Israeli martial art. Ah! <laughs> I mean, I'm scared of sh Well, I try to scare them more than anything else. I mean, one thing I'm doing in this class is every time I, I throw a punch, I'm yelling. I'm really releasing the air with it. And I find that it, I feel I, I, a way for me to release my own power. Welcome to 219 West. I'm Rachel Green. And I'm William Johnson. People in the U.S. are living longer and women are having children later in life. That often means they're still raising kids as their aging parents are becoming more dependent. It's a generation sandwich between caring for young and old. Sonia Swink reports on how hard it can be. There we go. Eleni Glatter is a busy mother of two. She is married, educated, and has a good job. However, six months ago, something changed. I don't know. I didn't expect him to, like, get sick and end up in the hospital. or You know what I mean? I just kind of thought he would go on like his parents did. Like, they both lived well into their 90s. This is my dad feeding Emmy when she was a baby. <sighs> There's my dad holding her. Eleni is part of a growing population of people known as the sandwich generation. Oh, that's the top of the cake. In order to be part of the sandwich generation, you need both young kids or kids for whom you have significant responsibility and aging parents. In order to have aging parents, you need to be a little later in childbearing than in your 20s. When Eleni had her first child at age 36, her parents were in their late 70s. When I had Kate, my dad, um, he was like, I think just about retired. And so I was really lucky to have like retired parents who, who were involved. Kate would like have sleepovers and I would go to the office. The good part of the sandwich is your parents maybe are helping you right? The, the old people aren't just the burden end of that sandwich. They're also a, a, a help. But this past year, her father fell sick. And just that back and forth to the hospital, taking Emmy with me, having to leave Emmy in the lobby with my mom or my brother and take turns talking to the doctor. The burden of care, according to Dr. Finkelstein, falls mostly on women. During this time, Eleni's mom was crippled right. with her own health That's complications. Crazy. You're not a burden, stop. My mother was confused. I think if I received this message, I'm telling you, like 10 days ago, I would have had a very different... Hi, Eleni. I would have been mother. panicking. I wanted to just, you know, have a few words with you. That's all. I'm lonely and uh, I don't know. I can't clean here anymore. I'm tired. Okay, so I should call her. What Eleni's mom felt is a common feeling among older people. The best situation is to have them live with a caring, nurturing support service, which generally would be a family member. If that's not possible, to retain them within their community and then have a home care attendant come in which would help them manage living as independently as possible. My brother called me later on that day and he's like, guess what? He said, I walked mom through Uber and she's on her way to see dad. 
And then she called me and I'm like, oh, she's calling. And she's like, guess where I am? I'm in an Uber. That was like the first breakthrough was with Uber and she changed and she wasn't as scared and she wasn't as forgetful. Since then, Eleni's seen her mom gain back her confidence. GPS? I know. Does he use GPS? Does he use GPS? In the next 20 years, the sandwich generation will continue to grow as women increasingly have children later in life and the boomer generation ages up. For 219 West, I'm Sonia Swink. Pad Thai is a lunchtime go-to for many people in this city, but why are there so many Thai restaurants to choose from? It's food for thought. Dalvin Brown set out to get to the bottom of this culinary curiosity. Thai food has taken 9th Avenue by storm, with as many as 30 restaurants within 15 blocks. Even with this number of options, business has never looked better for owners like Rocky Ramroon. Yogas love Thai food, um, I believe, you know, because Thai food has like a lot of flavors. And also, like the main thing is, um, Thai food is very affordable as well. You know, while it's good, it's also affordable. So I think it's a good choice for New York. Rocky is a partner at Viv Thai Restaurant on 9th Avenue and the owner of Tape, a Thai eatery in the Upper East Side. He believes that flavor and culture surrounding Thai food draws people in and keeps them coming back for more. It stands out on its own um, because the complex flavors of Thai food, you know, I think it hits all the four corners of your mouth. You know, like one, once all these things combine together, it just creates like a bomb in your mouth. The great flavor bombs aren't the only reason Thai food has become so popular. In 2001, the Thai government set out to create more than 3,000 restaurants worldwide in order to increase tourism revenue, according to Vice News. This trend is referred to as gastro diplomacy. The uh, government of Thailand was paying people, right, and the banks of Thailand were loaning people something up to like $3 million to go abroad and open Thai restaurants. Michael is a food writer for West 42nd Street Magazine and founder of In Your Mouth, a culinary podcast. For him, the reason behind gastro diplomacy is simple. In the hearts of people through their stomach, really. So, and I mean, what better way is there to do that, really? Since 2001, the number of Thai restaurants in the U.S. has doubled from 2,000 to more than 5,000. Rocky moved to New York in 2013 and watched the evolution of Thai restaurants unfold on 9th Avenue. He has his sights set on expanding Thai cuisine to the rest of the city. We don't, right now, we don't have that many Thai restaurants yet, as, as opposed to um, 9th Avenue in this kitchen. While some might compare the popularity of Thai to the city's love of other cuisines, like Chinese, Michael thinks the food is special in its own right. We get into what Thai is and what Thai encompasses. You have to remember that Thai, uh, Thai food from like the 15th, 16th century is a melting pot of other, of other cuisines. So the Thai people saw the delicious chilies and the curries and and the spices, and they were like, "Oh, we got this, and we know what to do with this," you know. And they made it uniquely theirs. And I think it is in itself, its own beautiful thing that's like nothing else anywhere. For Rocky, New York has been a land of opportunity. When asked about what he would say to others looking to move and follow a similar path, he shared some straightforward advice. Just work hard, don't be lazy. Yeah, just work hard and say yes to every opportunity. Yeah, don't say no. Yeah. And do your best, I think. It's, it's simple, but you know, it's. It works. For 219 West, this is Dalvin Brown. Next, bike lanes confuse riders and pedestrians alike, and veterans take to the ice. As the number of Thai restaurants continues to rise, so does the city's use of bike lanes. Right, Will? That's right, Rachel. We all know that a lot of folks in New York City use bikes to get around, so staying safe for them is important. Corey Matthews shows us a bike lane that was recently added, but is still causing problems. In New York City, biking is a way of life. The Department of Transportation says that more than 800,000 New Yorkers ride a bike regularly. Whether it's getting to work, school, or just to get some exercise, bikes are a regular sight in the Big Apple. 
The city has worked to keep these riders safe, and by 2018, it had added 1,240 miles of bike lanes, and more are still being added today. We're here on the Manhattan side of the Queens Rail Bridge, where a new bike path was put in in August of last year. Unfortunately, although the bike path was put in to keep riders and drivers safer, problems have still persisted. Bike paths are an accident waiting to happen. The way that it's been set up, the bikes are and the bicyclists are coming off the bridge in two different ways. And they're crossing, having to cross the bridge traffic that's trying to get onto the bridge here on 59th Street. And they're also cutting across, if you go down 2nd Avenue, they're cutting across traffic that's trying to get onto the bridge on 58th Street as well. They're in danger of getting hurt by opening doors for taxis and cars that are stopping right here to let people. And what's really horrifying as a pedestrian is they're flying in from every angle and they don't ob observe any of the rules of like regular New Yorkers. And they cut across us as we're trying to cross the street. So there's all these cross currents. We've contacted every agency possible. So at this point, the, the cities, it's like they're negligent. Unsafe is the wide-eyed tourist walking into the lane looking at their phone. It's not cars, it's not other bikes. It's a visitor that doesn't know their environment. This bike path still poses a danger to the bikers that cross it. And it's not just bikers that use these islands as well. It's pedestrians, scooters, walkers. Many people use this. As a matter of fact, there are three police officers now directing traffic because it's so busy. Residents have tried to petition the government to improve it, but so far, there haven't been any changes. For 219 West, I'm Corey Matthews. While biking is the exercise of choice for many New Yorkers, others are turning to activities for mental health or self-defense reasons. It is estimated that 30% of veterans experience trauma for years after returning from war. Layla Maiden has the story of one disabled vet who has found a way to help others like her stay active while on the road to recovery. Many veterans are dealing with the reality of readjusting to civilian life. One veteran has found a way to help with that transition. When I fell in love with ice skating and I realized, you know, when I'm on the ice, everything else goes away. It's just me and my blades. Well, I started skating five years ago as a form of low impact exercise. And I found out about the adaptive sports grant that the VA has. And I, a, a light bulb went off and I said, oh, I can start a program for people with disabilities and disabled vets. Here in the middle of Central Park is where Sherry Kuntner found the new home of Adaptive Skating USA. It's here where the veterans come together in camaraderie to learn how to skate. But beyond the icy surface, there's so much more. For these veterans, skating has become part of the healing process. My name is John O'Brien. Um, I'm retired from the United States Army. Well, when I came back from Iraq in 2000, 12, 13, um, I started having some memory issues. And like most people in my, my situation, you know, uh, you shrug it off, I'll be fine, you know. Uh, but as time goes on, we realize that uh, this isn't normal. People get out of the military and it's, here's your medications. Take this, take this, take this, take this, and that's, that's it. It's programs like this and uh, the Wounded Warriors and many other Nonprofit organizations who help soldiers and, and uh, sailors and airmen, people who either were injured or just retired from the military. After many years, the uh, transition is difficult. Mikel Garcia, the assistant director of the skate school at Woman Rink, is one of the coaches. It's an honor to, to be able to give them a little piece of me, of, of what I know. Um, because when they are out there, they, they, they give a piece of them to, to us, so. I like the, coming to the adaptive skating program because it, it showed me that I can do different activities that I'm not used to. 
and that um, it's okay to be out and do different things and that's help, very helpful for my physical and my mental health. Putting my helmet on. There we go. It helps me with my focus to build up my confidence and willing to learn more until I get comfortable on the ice and just just to be comfortable. I don't need to learn any tricks. 73.4% of all U.S. veterans have a VA service-connected disability. I get, a, I get a lot of people ask me, well, how do you find out about these organizations? And you, you do have to get on the internet and you just punch in veterans organizations, you'll find there are so many of them. There's so many out, people out there who are trying to help. Like, what a blessing this is. And I'd like to share it with other people that are maybe not, maybe they think or they're not aware of ice skating or its benefits and the positive impact that it can have on a person's life. <laughs> And now we go to Brooklyn, where rising cases of anti-Semitism have some learning new skills they never thought they'd need. I feel more confident when I'm out on the street. Beyond that, I, I've been very affected by the overt acts of anti-Semitism around the world, around the country, and most especially in New York City. Um, and even though I'm Jewish, it's not, I'm not identifiable as a Jewish woman, meaning I'm not wearing a, a wig, I'm not wearing you know, the clothes that a Hasidic woman would wear. I can pass, if you will. I joined this class just a month ago. I want to be able to act as a defender. Melissa is learning Krav Maga. It's a form of self-defense developed by the Israeli army was started in the 1930s uh, really as a, a means of defending on the street. Kind of mixed a whole bunch of arts, uh, just like boxing, wrestling, um, certain types of uh, Eastern practices such as karate. And it took kind of the best of all of that and tried to mishmash it all together into a system where if you're in a position where someone is attacking you, you will be able to have the most natural response. Krav Maga prepares people for all kinds of attacks. Choking, kicking, chokeholds. If that sounds extreme, remember this past winter, five people were stabbed during a private Hanukkah party in a suburb of New York City. Since I was probably 13, 14, I've been hearing stories saying how anti-Semitism is on the rise, but hearing, just hearing those stories weren't like, kind of didn't hit home until recently when the attacks started happening. That's when it really hit home. The attack in California, the attack in Brooklyn, the attack in Muncie, which is, the attack in Muncie happened five minutes from my house. That was like, really, really hit home. Um, and then on that same week, there was like two attacks in Brooklyn. Um, and that's when I realized I don't want to be defenses of something like that happens to me in my house, to my family. But Melissa says the real secret to self-defense isn't the move she's learning. Ah! <laughs> you know, I mean, scared of sh yeah. Well, I try to scare them more than anything else. I mean, one thing I'm doing in this class is every time I, I throw a punch, I'm yelling. I'm yeah. really releasing the air with it. And I find that it, I feel I, I, a way for me to release my own power but I also think in the back of my mind, if somebody's trying to attack me and there's this crazy woman coming at them screaming, they're gonna go, why am I bothering? Let me get out of here. For 219 West, I'm Buzz von Ornsteiner. While one group of people fights against discrimination, another group in the city is fighting to tear down past stereotypes. Sex work has been an industry stigmatized throughout history, but today some sex workers are using art to try and change the image. Rachel Sherman took a look at artists using creative methods to educate the public. I love comedy so much. I love that you guys show up to the show and it might be like deep belly laughs, it might be a TED talk, but it's really cool to feel so supported. My name is Jacqueline Francis. I'm also known as Jack the Stripper. And I'm 33 years old, just like Jesus. 
Jack the Stripper is using comedy to change the way people look at sex workers. Though she gave up stripping years ago, she now hosts the Venus Flytrap comedy show to share stories from the profession. We're known for doing a really sex positive show in New York City, and that is, I'm so proud of that um, reputation. This industry is like misogynist and brutal and run by a bunch of really unhappy men. People want to be entertained. People want something fun and sparkly and accessible. And that's what I'm here for. Jack isn't alone in her quest to challenge sex work stereotypes. And the conversation is becoming more mainstream. The Open Society Foundation recently held a sex work pop-up exhibition in Manhattan. For Midori, a San Francisco-based artist and educator, one of the best ways to get her message out is art. It is effective in being able to convey the emotionality, to allow people to step into somebody else's life. She put out a call to past and current sex workers for artifacts that hold special meaning. I expected uh, the vibrator, the dildo, the costumes. I, I didn't expect a teacup. I didn't expect a painting. I didn't anticipate that I would end up crying as I'm reading the letters of what objects meant. Once you enter the space, you realize that you are witnessing other lives. It changes your perspective. It creates a productive discomfort. A sex worker is defined as an adult who receives money or goods in exchange for consensual sexual services or erotic performances. And the terminology is important. Prostitution carries a heavy burden, a heavy stigma. Like for example, prostitutes, people would say, home wrecker, or disease carrier. But sex work is recognized as work. The word work help us to think about labor. But there are still misconceptions. Trafficking is forced. Sex work is a decision or a choice. Though the artists use different mediums, the message is universal. The, the lack of humanity that people like assigned to sex workers is really sh I think it's really important to have compassion for everybody who's working, whatever kind of work they're doing. We could really stand to see how we're similar instead of how we're different. I feel so safe here. I feel like I can speak freely. I feel like the comics up here can. And I, that's just really powerful. I don't know. I just really want, I want everybody to be living their best lives. <laughs> And what that means to each of us is complicated, and we should stop judging each other. I'm Rachel Sherman, 219 West. That's all for this edition of 219 West. I'm Rachel Green. And I'm William Johnson. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.